Okay, everybody, this is the last and final presentation of the Food Security Series here this weekend at the Fall Fair. A very important and timely topic as Una Sinclair of Highcroft Farm in Sorrento is going to speak to her experience that she's been having during this wildfire season of having to evacuate livestock and all the preparedness required for having a homestead as we continue to expect in the future that we're going to continue to have drought and heat and the potential of wildfire. So this is really important information that we are going to have recorded so that we can get it out while we still continue to be in the wildfire season. It's a beautiful day right now, but we are not quite out of it yet. And in fact, Yuna has just mentioned how she's still anticipating being put back onto alert. So we're going to open this up to her. I'm going to turn this off, and she is going to tell us about the experience that she has had. Hi, my name's Yuna, and I would like to know if anybody here has livestock. Does anybody here have a farm? Okay, so some people are leaving. <laughs> so you have livestock? Okay, so what's in your farm? Chickens, there's cows on the property. Chickens and cattle. Ducks. 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 Chicken, Fowl. cattle, duck, fowl. Anybody else? Does anybody have a friend who has a farm with livestock? Okay, so uh, those are two things that are super important. Friends and the animals on the farm. So I'm going to go back to August uh, the 16th. And my daughter said to me on August the 16th, in this kind of scary voice, she said, Mom, there's a new moon coming, and everything is going to change. And that was August the 16th, and I'm like, yeah, OK, that's fine. You know, that's my daughter. Well, August the 17th, we were down on the beach in Sorrento. And we saw the most amazing sight. We saw fire kind of start on the hill, on the North Shore, and then it exploded left and right in winds that were around about 80 clicks an hour plus. And the winds to begin with were blowing to the north, so that fire probably was stimulated to go away but then very quickly the wind started to change and we saw it rush to Squilax, we saw it rush to towards Solista and we all stood on the beach and we saw that and we watched it and we said this feels like trouble. We had no idea how much trouble that really meant. So the next day was Friday and the sky was an ominous color of orange and dirty brown and angry colors. And in the afternoon, we started to hear explosions. So we're in Notch Hill, we're on the top of the hill above the cemetery, and we heard the explosions of propane tanks on the North Shore, Scotch Creek most likely. We never thought that it was coming our way. We we're helping friends. We had friends that had evacuated to our property, and we were helping them. We didn't realize for a moment that it was coming our way. We felt protected. We thought the lakes between us. So I have 10 low-line Angus black cattle. Anybody know what low-line Angus is? They're very sweet. They're black. <laughs> and I'll tell you why that's important coming up. And I have about 73 sheep and two horses. One horse is trained for pulling carts and the other one is a nutcase and she is, she's like a remedial problem. So anyway, uh, what happened then was we got a phone call from a friend of mine and she was at the top of Alson Road and she said, I can't come and help you load the animals. Which was, you know, well I thought, well, why is she calling me to tell me she can't come and help me load the animals? She said, we're fighting fire in our backyard right against our house. So it's like, whoa, 
But Elson Road is a little ways away, right? Just a little ways away from where I am on the top of Notch Hill above the cemetery. But right away I realized that my right-hand gal was busy and by the sound of her voice, she was dealing with something she'd never had to deal with before and she didn't know the outcome. You could really tell she was in a, a rough place. So, um, at that point, somebody else called me because now I'm going to add a new twist to this story. I don't use cell technology. I don't have a smartphone. I don't have a cell phone. And so I like to be very free <laughs> in the world. And uh, I gave up my phone in 2007 uh, for a lot of reasons. So I wasn't getting any kind of alerts or any kind of anything. My neighbor called me. Now it's getting on for like, six o'clock or seven o'clock, she said, we're under evacuation alert. Well, right away, if somebody says you are got to be alerted, you become really alert. I mean, your eyes open wider, your heart goes a little bit faster. What does this mean? So I thought, okay, no problem. Everything's okay, breathe. My husband started rushing around like a crazy man because we have a really big pond that is dry right in front of the house. And he decided if we could get enough plastic to line it, he could fill it with water. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because we were all running around. The thing that happened next was it began to get dark. I moved the horse trailer, or the one trailer I have, into the cow field where my 10 cattle were. And all of a sudden, the sky was raining ash and foot-long pieces of flaming branches. Smoking, actually, they weren't flaming. And I looked up to Black Mountain. Do you know Black Mountain? Anybody know where Black Mountain is? It's above Sorrento. And it looked like Mordor from Lord of the Rings. There were fingers of fire coming over you could see trees exploding on the skyline. And I looked at that and my brain went to mush. Because I was dealing with fear, primal fear, a fear I'd never experienced before. and never actually thought I would experience the fear of uncontrollable fire. And things that I loved, my animals, at risk. I didn't actually think of myself. It's like, oh, that's okay but it was really all my livestock. So at that point, the people who had been using our place to evacuate to became stressed for a second time. And en masse, they drove out of our property as fast as they could while I was trying to figure out how to load up animals. So I thought, well, that's an interesting experience. And I will say, you know your true friends in an emergency those who run away from you, and those who run to you. And that is one of, one of the most important things I can talk about is the kindness of strangers who have the empathic ability to put themselves in your shoes and say, these people must be really stressed, how can I help? So I am now out in the field by myself with 10 black cows on incredibly smoky night with uh, ash raining down upon us and Mordor, the land of Mordor, <laughs> Mount Doom, coming over in fingers of fire across the mountain. I actually thought I might have a heart attack right then. <laughs> My husband had decided that he was going to start an experimental viaduct program. He was going to move water in the middle of this great stressful time, he was going to build something that would move water 2,000 feet from one pond to the pond in front of the house. So he was very busy and he was not paying any attention at all to me. So I decided who am I going to save? What am I going to save? Because it's just me by myself with all these cows. So I said, well, I'm going to save my cows. All right. I, I love all of my animals, but I'll save my cows. So I had the trailer, I went into, the trailer was already parked in the field in preparation. I got hay, I got feed, I put it in there, and then I attempted with my wildfire mush brain to hook up 
the truck to the trailer. And this is where the problem is. When I, I'll just talk about me, as I was dealing with this stress and fear, and actually every now and again looking at the fire, and then, and then having really very great anxiety, I couldn't put a thought one after another. I started to make really bad, silly, dangerous mistakes. Just in hooking up a trailer, just in trying to deal with it. So then I started talking to myself. And I talked myself through every single action of hooking up the trailer, doing it properly, doing the double checks, taking the blocks out on the wheels, and doing all that stuff, and getting it done. By this time, the cows had figured out that Nirvana was inside the trailer, and they were all squeezed in there, all being four or five. Now you remember, there's 10, so five are out. And I'm like, how am I gonna do this? I actually don't even know where I'm going. Where am I taking them? And if I get out, will I get back? Because you all know that you need to move quickly if you're taking livestock out. You need to move during the alert period because if an order comes down, you won't get back in and nobody will get in to save you. I actually have found a trick to that and I'll tell you that later, but anyway. So um, I jumped into the back of the trailer, squeezed past these cows in a way that I have never done before. So I put myself at some risk, but uh, my brain had literally gone to mush and all I could think of was get all the cows out, close the trailer door, make them go up to the barnyard and I can get them in a small pen. Well, remember now, it's black of night. Neighbors are evacuating at top speed down our one lane road in the dark. Mordor is coming over the hill like this. I'm not looking at Mordor. I'm like, I will not look. I will just not look. I will keep my head down the whole time. I'm talking to myself in bites. Okay, now, Yuna, do this. Okay, now, Yuna, you've got to start the truck. I'm talking to myself like I'm Jiminy Cricket on my own shoulder. It was the only way to keep me focused. So I thought, okay, I've got to get these black cows in the black of night across a dark road and go up a black hill towards the barnyard. No lights. I had a big flashlight. I put it on the ground. I shone it. I opened the gate and I opened the other gate and I shone it across the road. <laughs> and I hooped and hollered and I chased the cows into the black, into the blackness across the road with the ash falling and Mordor at my shoulder. I had no idea if they would go the right direction. None whatsoever. And I also thought, well, if somebody comes at top speed, because everybody was driving really fast. It was like everybody was leaving the area like, Rrr! and I'm like, okay, maybe the cow will turn towards them and they'll see their eyes before they hit them. Because that was really my thought, what's gonna happen next? So cows did go up. So here's another thing, flashlights for an emergency, or lights that you can put on the ground that have a red flash to it, anything that's warning. Cows do not like to cross the road if they can't see where they're going. Sheep, even worse. Horses, all of them. So you need to be able to know if you're, I mean, my mind was, well, we'll just, if we ever need to evacuate, it'll be a nice day, it'll be light, we can do all this. Pitch black. So in your emergency uh, farmyard, barnyard kit, you need to have things that can go on the road to say, come here, you know, or like move there or whatever. And the farm entrance is different than the house entrance. So another thing I've learned is put a sign that says Highcroft Farm Barn Entrance and have lights there, even solar lights. Because through the, really the grace of my neighbor, she knew what a nutcase I am and she knew that I didn't have any kind of connectivity to Facebook, so she got onto Facebook and she called people to come and help me. Because my husband is building the viaduct, right? And he's got my son helping him and his girlfriend, and that's, that's all they're doing. They, they're not paying attention to me, which is like, okay, I've gotta save the livestock. So uh, people came down the road in the dark, but I had no signage 
So number one, lights and signage, because you don't know what kind of emergency situation you might be in, if it's daytime, nighttime, and also uh, a couple of times, I ran top speed down the hill and kind of standing in the road, hoping their headlights would pick me up, hoping they'd see me and then keep going and come into the next barnyard. So signage is important. Lights are important. Flashlights are super important. People arrived, and this is where the kindness of strangers and community, just what treasures. I can't say enough about the people that are heroes. And there's quite a lot of people that have come out as heroes in this situation. But they came with trailers. It took six trailer loads to get my animals out. And that didn't include the chickens, because it's like, OK, fricassee chicken, I can't do anything more about this one. But I had no idea where the animals were going to. I'd never met the people before. I didn't know the conditions. And my sheep were split up into four different groups. So we've got moms that don't have their babies and friends that are not with friends. And also sheep have a whole different need for fencing, right? A cow can go into a certain type of fencing, but sheep can't. I just had to trust. I didn't even get people's addresses or phone numbers. And it was like the animals were loaded up and they were gone. And then two young fellows came back twice and one person and another person. So a plan ahead of time to say, OK, where would my animals go? And to go and talk to somebody and make an arrangement. If I'm in need, can I come to your place? If you're in need, come to my place. Now, I had done that already, but I'd done it with friends that were already either in the evacuation order zone or the evacuation alert zone. So that didn't work. So your, your support team for your homestead or your farm needs to be far enough away that they're not going to be impacted with what is impacting you. And so my animals ended up going to Silver Creek and Armstrong, three different places. The first night, eight sheep got out because they didn't have the right fencing, but it all turned out really wonderfully in the end of that. Does anybody have a question right now? So it's really about planning ahead and believing that we need to form those bonds and connections before Mordor comes to visit you, before those, that fire comes over. And even as I speak this, I'm thinking about the anxiety that I went through. There was, um, after the animals left, it was like a piece of my heart went with every animal. I couldn't believe how upset I was. I didn't know if they were, you know, getting the right care or the right feed or if they, um, if my little milk cow, it, was she going to get milked? Was she going to get mastitis? Was she going to get sick? I, it was, it was so hard. And I know other people that have said that they've never had to evacuate and that it was so hard. So one of the things I did is every time, see, this is a little, it's just a little tiny little rock. It's from my daughter. It, she told me something about, oh, it, it helps your third chakra or something. I don't know. So I put a rock in my pocket. I put this, I have an orange one and this little green one. And when I started to feel so anxious that I didn't know what to do with myself, I would just hold it or go like this. And strangely enough, it did help. It was, it was, a, it was a good thing. The... Um, the day of the evacuation, we started loading animals at somewhere around about 10.30 to 11 at night, and we didn't finish until 3 a.m. So the other thing is, if you have livestock, you have to have a good system for loading, because that was one of the problems. Strangers came, the animals are like stranger danger, and even though they were in a pen, they literally tried to bash themselves crazy against the fence because it's, it's very stressful. My neighbor, her pig, her mama pig had baby pigs at that same moment when the fire was coming over and the ash was raining down and the thick smoke was in all our eyes and nose. And her pig began to eat her piggies, piglets. So they, it ate one or two, and then she realized something was happening, and she rescued them. So there's this um, uh, preservation 
mechanism in certain animals that if they have given birth to young and they think it's a dangerous situation, they'll take them out. So uh, that, was an, that was another, and she couldn't evacuate. She had a pig in, in labor. Her husband had just smashed his leg and he was in a wheelchair. And she had an even closer bird's eye view of Mordor coming over the mountain. So unexpected things all the time. Uh, in the dark, not enough light in the barnyard. I was falling over things, tripping over things. There wasn't enough light. So light becomes crucial that you have got really good lights and floodlights in your barnyard and you have a system where you can corral your animals and you can get them on a chute and into any kind of container. Because people who show up will have all kinds of different um, trailers. And not all of them, some of them the step is a little bit higher or some of them have a door that slides or doesn't open completely. And so it's really about keeping those animals safe and getting them out of there. So by 3 a.m., my husband had given up on the viaduct um, building project and uh, the suction he had put into the swamp had just sucked up so much debris that it had given out. But I was so alert by that point. I had become over alerted. <laughs> so I went driving around because I'm like, what is happening out there? And I went out and down to the highway um, and along through Sorrento. And this is where wildfire mush brain really is a problem because somebody, and I feel terribly, terribly sorry for them, they had been distracted while driving two horses in a trailer and in front of the pharmacy had, I have no idea how it happened, but had driven up on the concrete and the trailer had flipped and the horses had fallen out onto the highway. And one was apparently very injured and the other one was less injured, although severely injured. So at 3 a.m., that had happened at about 10 p.m. So at 3 a.m., I'm driving through there, and I look and I see this poor fellow standing beside a trailer and the truck, and uh, it looked like something on the ground, and I thought, oh, I really would like to support him. And I thought, you know what? I, I just, I have no more left to give right now. Somebody else has to support this poor person. But this is what happens. The brain becomes overwhelmed. And it's so important that you either have a Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder and you start talking to yourself, or you have a really, you know, someone that can keep you grounded and keep, keep you making good decisions, keep you safe, a team member. And find a team member it's somewhere out of your area that is willing to come. Somebody in Salmon Arm come to Sorrento, or somebody in Sorrento go to Vernon, or whatever it takes. But it's so important to get that support. So, and, and organize, how many trailers do you need to get your animals out? I'm at the place in my life where I'm like, okay, I don't want to go through this ever again. I only want as many animals as I can evacuate. So, uh, I would never want to do more than two trailer loads during an alert, because if the order goes on, I don't get back in. And so that, that is a real problem. We saw this happen in Monte, Monte Creek, Monte Lake, that fire. I drove past the um, highway turnoff. There must have been 12 to 20 trucks and trailers sitting there and the police wouldn't let them in. And they were coming in first or second loads to help people get their livestock out. And it was a tragedy because we do know farmers there, we know ranchers there, and they had their cattle and the grass fire came over, the animals' uh, lower legs and hoofs were so badly burnt they had to be euthanized. So it's really important. I, a friend of mine, he's like, well, I'm just going to leave my animals in the field. Um, that is an option if it's a nice green field and not something that's got a lot of dry grass. But the sparks from trees and the noise and the smoke and the confusion it can mean that they can stampede. It can mean that they can just start running blindly. And then you've got even more tragedy. Uh, I know some people, and I thought of doing this, is you can take your horse, a horse's mane, uh, and you can uh, put an ID tag right in their mane. So ID tags for something like horses that you can braid into their mane, that's a great idea. 
Um, in a rush, I wrote their <laughs> I wrote their phone number on their hooves in indelible pen, and I tried to do it on their shoulder. And luckily, they're Palominos, so you know it did show up. But the best thing to do is braid an ID tag, like a dog ID tag, with the phone number and the name right in their mane. And if you do have to let them go, at least they've got ID on them. Because you don't want to let them go necessarily with a halter on, because what if that gets caught up and they panic and then they break their neck or something silly. Horses are silly, just as the way it is. So um, if you have animals, look at who would come, where would they go, who's my support, and have that plan. And like me, I'm, well, okay, I need a really big livestock hauler so I can get everything out in two trips, not six trips. Does anybody have any questions right now? Right now, I think Black Mountain is smoking very badly, and new fires are developing every minute. Just even leaving the farm made me feel really anxious. I had to go take my little, where's my thing? Ah, I had to touch it, and like, oh, okay, it's over there, all right, good. Um, yeah. What have you been doing to prepare your farm then? Okay, so what have we been doing to prepare the farm? So back in the spring, I said, look at those 10 cedars that are hanging over the top of our house. They're not even mm, three feet from the house. They're beautiful. They've been there for, I think, 100 years, maybe 80 years. I said in the spring, we're going to take those down this year. Everybody's like, no, no, we can't take those down. I'm like, okay, so I made three or four appointments with the feller, and he wanted support, and we all had to do it, and it all got canceled every time. So here's where you know your friends, who runs to you in a problem, in the war, who comes into the war zone, and who runs away. So uh, the fire is approaching, <laughs> the trees are magnificently cedar combustibles right above the house. I told my husband, there's no way we can save the house if those go up. And uh, he's like, well, I think I can spray like halfway up, and I'm like, ah. So we had a friend that came, and we have taken down since then, maybe 30 or 40 cedars that are basically all around the house. And I think that that is very important. I, I never want to feel that um, much stress. I love the trees. I love everything about them. But I can't manage um, critical infrastructure in that kind of an emergency with that much foliage that is highly combustible. So uh, we have been doing that. Also, I have asked my husband for years to have a swimming pool, just one swimming pool, because it's so hot in the summer. I just want to be able to go in the swimming pool. We currently have five swimming pools, okay? Five swimming pools all around the house. I haven't gone swimming in one of them, but uh, swimming pools are a great thing to have because the fire department, if you are working with a fire close by, they will come and fill those up and keep your water supply. Neighbors will come and fill those up. So talking again about the community, uh, a fire from an ember, about five properties over on Mount Helium, started a couple of days later after the Friday the 18th. 49 local people found their way to that fire and put it out very, very quickly before the fire department came to assess it. I want you to listen to that word. They came to assess it. So it was a quite a big fire and they used fire hoses and they all had fire uh, equipment on the back of their vehicles. And what a strength of the community. It absolutely, absolutely joyful that that happened. And they came together again for another similar incident the next morning. And they all worked together. And people were saying, look, if you need water, I'll bring you water. My friends, and these are the unsung heroes, so my friends at the top of Elson, who were going to come and help me load the animals in a crisis, they fought the fire themselves. Just a husband and wife and a friend for about four days without any proper support. And then they were under evacuation order, so they shut off the water to the area and they shut off the power so we managed to find, we as in the local community, managed to find a back way through the fields. And we were taking supplies to them because their bravery, their actions at the top of 
Elson stopped the fire going all the way down to the lake. And that happened also in Lee Creek with people that stopped the fire right. Jim Cooperman at the back of his house, he's one of the fellows that I've read quite a bit about and, and so many others, so many others throughout the North Shore stopped it right there. Okay, so somebody, I don't think they're talking to me. So we've taken trees down. We uh, picked up end of season, half price swimming pools. We have five swimming pools positioned around. I also want to tell you, um, I, I was in Buckerfield <laughs> getting some uh, chicken feed in the middle of all this. Uh, and I saw a great big, a massive animal waterer. It's a big blue one. It was like 1,600 gallons. It was, re it was really good. So I said, okay, I'm going to take that home. Well, it was closing time for Buckerfields, and they valiantly tried to tie this thing on with string. It wouldn't fit in my animal uh, horse trailer. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be a problem. A massive, very heavy container on the back of my truck tied on with string. So I ran across the road and banged on Delco's door. Do you know Delco? They're the company that fixes all the tractors and they have all that equipment. They were closed, but I'll call him Daddy Delco because I still don't know his name. Daddy Delco was there and, and he sees this face, you know, it's always a highly alerted face because we're under evacuation alert and nobody gets disalerted. You're just alert the whole time. And I'm like, well, um, I got a problem. This guy's trying to tie this on with string. He just took control of the whole situation. He came over, he said, we're going to do this and this and this and we're going to use this. And in fact, little lady, you're not taking this home at all. My sons are coming and they're going to take it home for you. And that is just so, I can't tell you how thankful I am to the kindness of strangers. I didn't, didn't know him, but banging on the door, really, was just like, woo! And he came and helped. So I really want to give a shout out to them because they went above and beyond the call of duty on that one. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, our hay trailers and our other trailers have cubies on them filled with water. They are movable firefighting. We have another trailer that has water on it, movable firefighting. Uh, we have three pumps that are mobile, so with, with the fire hoses on them. And uh, we have the swimming pools, <laughs> which are great. Uh, you, I would say that, and I would classify me as an average person. The average person does not have the know-how to fight a wildfire and to realize how much water is needed. And if you are not fully prepared, and if you don't have the water supply, you gotta really think twice if you decide to stay in an evacuation order situation. It's not for everybody to stay. It's for people that have experience. I really believe that after going through this. Um, and to get, getting overwhelmed is, is really tough. A friend came, uh, the day after Fredrickson lit, lit up. I don't know if you guys know this, but we've had quite a few alerts that go to extreme. So I think it was like 3.30 one morning a week ago, I got a phone call, we're jarred out of our sleep. We've gone to sleep at about midnight. And um, she said, the cemetery is on fire. Well, the cemetery is right below us. So it was like, you know, we're asleep, we're stumbling around, we're bumping into each other. And we're like, okay, let's go see what's happening. And as soon as we go outside, the alarms are everywhere, the sirens of all, we had no idea. We drove down the road and Fredrickson was just on fire. So, so it was coming, the whole mountain was on fire. And, uh, and indeed it was, it was a really, it was a, it was a big fire. Now s there's also, what happens in a time like this is disaster tourism. Have you ever heard of that? I had never heard of that. So disaster tourism, this is what it looked like for us. Oh wow, what are those people doing? They're drinking wine outside the cemetery? Oh, they're watching the, they're having a wine fest? Sitting, watching the fire burn outside the cemetery? Oh, okay, that's interesting. So disaster tourism is one reason that the professional caregivers, <laughs> that's a nice name for police, SWAT, and military, they will uh, close the highway. And a lot of people got very anxious that the highway was closed. But honestly, that highway was super dangerous for quite a, quite a period of time. Um, there's a lot of funny things that happened in the middle of all this. 
Uh, and I, I probably go all over the map with what I'm talking about now, but um, they blockaded us all over, right? There were blockades, and you can't go here, and you can't go there, and um, you can't get into Sorrento. And a friend of mine who has a business in Sorrento, she said, I need to get some medication out of my store, and I've left it there. And I said, okay, I'll figure out a way to get it for you. So I had this secret weapon. It's here. It's really tiny. It's kind of like James Bond. But yeah, you go like this. Yeah, and you put it on like this. All right, okay. So that's really bright red lips, right? And uh, I don't know if you've watched any of the videos, but there's an RCMP guy and he shows up everywhere. It's like, where's Waldo? Like he's over here, no, he's over there. He's at this blockade, no, he's on the North Shore. He's in pretty much everybody's video. He's kind of heavy set with a kind of graying beard. He's just everywhere. So I go up to him and I put on this super red lipstick and smile and go, hey, my friend needs to get her medication. And you know, he was like very stern. And I'm like, would you like to escort me? And that's it. We would get in and get the meds and get out again. So <laughs> that gave me a little bit of a laugh. But um, I think that a lot of people who are very anxious and traumatized, and I would like to say that this is a trauma event for the whole community. and it, it matters to each and every person what kind of trauma they experienced. Was it the loss of a home? Was it um, a pet? Was it their daughter? Was whatever it was, it's traumatic for the, for the area. And I'd be listening to the Armstrong IPE announcements, and I'm like, how can life be normal? What are these people doing? Life's not normal. And a lot of people fell into very dark, despondent places. Uh, with the constant level of anxiety because we have not been without fire and smoke since August the 18th. So, and it still continues right now and based on low humidity, high heat, uh, they're saying it could go on for another month and no real rain in the forecast. The amount of rain to really control a fire is 30 millimeters. So if you're going to do a rain dance, it's 30 millimeters, okay? Don't forget that. That's the request, all right? 30 millimeters. So um, I can't remember where I am in my little chit-chat now, but um, the, uh, the state of being anxious and alerted worked well for me because I lost a lot of weight. I just stopped eating. I couldn't eat. Some people say, I've talked to friends and they're like, oh no, all I did was eat. And another thing, it's amazing how you get to be really clear about what you like in your house and what you don't. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna pack a little trailer with the things that I need to take with me. And I, I felt really, really annoyed that one of the first things I had to think about taking with me was all the tax papers. I thought, really? I have to think about this now? But I did, I put them in. And then I went through my clothes and I'm like, I don't like any of these clothes, I'm leaving them. And then I looked at my pictures on the wall and I'm like, I never really liked that painting. Why, why do I have it on my wall? It was like Marie Kondo wildfire edition, if you know who Marie Kondo is. And I, I packed all my clothes and then all these things, it's like, well, that's too small for me and that I don't like. And so I just left them. I have not unpacked our trailer. Our trailer is still full. The good news is I lost enough weight that I can wear all the clothes that I said I wouldn't take with me because they were too small. That's a good thing. Yeah. Are the animals back? So we brought the animals back. So here's what's really stressful. <laughs> it's like rush, 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 get the animals out of here. Rush, 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 take them hay. Rush, 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 set up panels for them because they're escaping and nobody has the right fencing. And rush, 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 it's so much rush all this time and then Oh, all of a sudden, the sky is clear. The government has decided that now you must bring them back. You have 96 hours to bring them back. Rush, 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 because you have to bring them back now. Doesn't matter that everything's still smoking. You gotta get them back now. Yeah. Why 96 hours? Uh, God told the government, I don't know, 96 hours, because I have farm status and I'm part of a government compensation program where the people that take the animals receive compensation. That compensation runs out 96 hours after the evacuation alert is rescinded. It's nothing about me particularly, it's about 
a government compensation emergency operations center. Very helpful, by the way, very helpful, lovely people. I don't have anything negative to say about them at all. So um, brought them back, super joyful. The cows stampeded, it was hilarious. It was so lovely and because they'd been gone for two weeks, the grass had riz and was green and that was exciting. And then uh, the sheep took four loads to bring back and that was stressful because uh, all the little boys who, um, this is the first year where I'm castrating them with a, a little rubber and I used an iodine to be extra careful that they wouldn't get any infections from the constriction. The iodine ate the little rubber and instead of one ram and 20 little eunuchs, I literally have, you know, 15 crazy boys. And my breeding program has just been totally destroyed. So uh, just before coming here, I was separating them all because it's, um, it's a very ugly scene in my barnyard uh, with too many rams and too many uninterested gals. So um, I think you just have to expect that if you go through this kind of disruption, you may find that a lot of your well-laid livestock plans also become disrupted. And you just have to say, this is a strange year. I'm going to stay calm with it. I'm going to breathe through this. I would say one of the things that has been the hardest to deal with is anxiety, is a sense of not being able to calm down at night, not being able to feel, you know, I would go to bed at night and I'm like, okay, cows are good, sheep are good, chickens are locked up, horses are good, dogs are good, cats are good, all of that kind of stuff. I couldn't do that. So that knowledge that everything I was responsible for was outside of my control. And that produced a lot of anxiety. And then when Fredrickson kicked off and it's like, okay, you really are gonna have to fight fire now, that was highly a, a lot of anxiety. Um, the best sprinklers for a house or building that I have seen are the WASP, W-A-S-P, and they clip onto your gutters and they go 30 over the house and 30 in front of the house. You have to have a pretty good water supply with pressure, but those are the best I've seen and they're available online as far as I know. I haven't seen them available elsewhere, but maybe. Um, friends with totes, get, if you, there's a place in Kamloops on the highway, I don't know if they still have them, but they would have those totes, the plastic totes that you can put in the back of a truck and fill with water, you, you, it's good to have those. My friends who were fighting, they positioned them all through the forest and then they would get filled up from different means and then now they're doing spots, you know, where you fill up your backpack with water and you, and you spot the fire, do the putting it out. So um, those are really important. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, well, it depends what the orders are like now. I think based on what's happening on Black Mountain, I would expect some more evacuation orders to come in. Uh, I, I, it's very unfortunate that when the evacuation order comes in, that the police show up, sometimes military, and, and a heavy presence and you're dealing with people that are traumatized and anxious uh, in somewhat of a war zone because not to make light of war, but when your whole natural life is disrupted, it's, it, you know, it's, people get really, it's not normal. It's a very, very tough thing to go through. And uh, when those blockades come in, I think there needs to be a little bit more uh, explanation by the professionals that are blocking to keep people safe and they need to explain it instead of them becoming angry and really aggressive and offensive and you know I, I believe that they need some training in that to defuse defuse a situation say look here's what's going on here's some pictures this is why you can't go down that road it's not like we're doing a takeover of your community 
you know, to be really aggressive with local people who are traumatized and anxious is completely the wrong way to go. Yesterday, when the top of the Black Mountain went on fire, for the first time we saw uh, seven aircraft, seven water bombers come in, and two helicopters. But it's bigger today. Sometimes we joke. We're like, yeah, they're gonna do a back burn. So um, that's a bad joke in our place now. But uh, we have not seen them able to put out the fires on the mountain beside us. And I think it's going to have to be the season changing. Uh, so we've denuded the place. We're full of watering containers. We have swimming pools. Thank you, Canadian Tire, for your end of season sales. Uh, we have containers that can be filled. Uh, there's a truck that can come with 4,000 gallons. So 4,000 gallons will pretty much fill two nice size blow up swimming pools. And those are really important that it's near critical infrastructure. Uh, that's what I've learned. Another friend came who is a firefighter and he said, look, if everything is flying, um, what's that burning stuff? Come on guys, I've just lost my mind for a second. Embers. embers. So if the air is full of burning embers, they will go under where your, where your house meets the bottom. So you have to soak down all around the edge of your house. And he pointed to where we have some underneath decking that's cedar. And he goes, that has to be all soaked down. And then he said, look, there's your propane tank. So you need to cover that with um, mats or carpet or blankets and just soak it down, soak it all down. So he came with some really good advice. Um, at that point, because it's really the embers that get into wood piles. Nobody should ever have a wood pile close to their house or against their house. I know of a house in the North Shore that burned down because the fire got into the wood pile, and the house next to it did not burn down. So, wood piles are super dangerous because it's nice and dry, and never against the house or close to the house. Uh, those things, of course, we think are common sense. I think, our, uh, I think we have to be prepared for hot and dry. I think we have to be prepared to help our neighbors. Uh, if, you, if you have any friends that are half an hour away from you, or an hour away from you and they have a farm, tell them, you know, call us if you need help. Because bodies make a big difference in keeping a person able to stay calm and make good decisions. When the first people arrived with the horse trailer, they were looking at Mount Doom that was coming over <laughs> all this fire and they said it's okay we're volunteer fire people from silver creek and we want you to know that you have a few hours because for me i didn't know i didn't know how soon it would be there and we know in wind it can go what 20 kilometers in 12 hours so very it can move very i, I believe fire can move faster than i can run if it's really windy so they really calmed me down but it's really good to have somebody that can say we're going to get through this, you know, and, and to, to really be supportive in a time like this. And I now I would do that for anybody. I would do that. But I have to get a really big trailer. So if you know of a really big trailer for sale, it has to fit 73 sheep and 10 cows and two horses. And uh, it sounds like I need a jumbo jet. I need a semi-trailer. <laughs> That's right. I need something like that. Any more questions? Ah, it's total silence. It's just total silence. That's what it's like. So um, my husband gets up at 2 a.m. pretty much every night, walks out in his slippers and this and that, and goes up the hill, and we look over at Black Mountain and Mount Helium, and we're like, is the dragon awake tonight? We've called it the dragon. A friend of mine, Deanna, as she showed health food, she showed me the map, and she goes, look, it's exactly a dragon. So it kind of stuck. And I'm like, is the dragon sleeping tonight? Or are the dragon's eyes open tonight? Well, two nights ago, the dragon had one eye open. And uh, my husband had to go to work in the morning and he went to bed really early. And I thought, I'm not gonna tell him there's fire on the hill. Like we're talking trees exploding fire. I'm just not gonna say a thing. And I sat there like, okay, who can I talk to? And I thought, I don't want to freak anybody out. So I just sat there, and then I realized I could have a little bit of whiskey and probably feel okay. 
And on that, <laughs> me not being a drinker, whiskey a couple of times, I had to. I had to. It's actually really medicinal, uh, even though I totally hate the taste. So um, I, think, uh, I think this community is totally awesome. I think there's strength here that most of us don't realize until something really challenging happens. And then there is the ability for us to join together. And I, ha I have had somebody say to me, what has gone on here with neighbor helping neighbor? He's never seen that, say, in the city or the town where people are just really not as connected. And, and you don't have to know your neighbor. Your neighbor is somebody who just wishes you the best and is trying to make things better. And that's a neighbor. And that's so tremendous. And I'm very, very thankful to live here. I'm not ready to run away. Um, I would like to have a real swimming pool that I actually could swim in because swimming pools are a fantastic way to have a big source of water that you can pull on. So if your grandchild or your kid says, Mom, Dad, Grandpa, can I have a swimming pool? Like, yes, just get them the biggest swimming pool you can because going forward, I think it's a great solution. And we're not that close to the lake that we can pump it up from there. Okay, any more questions? I have no idea what the time is. Somebody's going to tell me. So I'm good, right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for coming to this. And it, it's so nice to see you all here. <laughs>